I'm Scott Al Miller. It's the 9th of September, 2023. This is my vlog of daily life living in Nicaragua. Today, we're going to be answering some viewer questions because we've had a really busy night. I had a lot of work and I just needed a chance to get a little bit of sleep and get the video done. And we got some great birds that will probably be edited out, but we'll see if you can hear them in this video or here in the garden today. And I will see all of you right after the bump. today's episode by saying I'm a little bit disappointed that people are not getting down in those comments and leaving enough really questions or discussion points, at least ones that we're able to use, to talk about on the show. I've got a couple for today, but it's been a few weeks since we've done a Q&A and I like doing these, uh, but I go down, I try to make sure I go through all of your questions when I see something that I can really respond to. I, uh, I take note of it, I take a screenshot and try to add it to the show. And there has been so little that we have, we've been a little while. We have a couple for today, but it's extremely little. So I uh, take a moment, both either now or as we're discussing things, pause the show, scroll down. If you're on the TV, go to a computer and do it. But you can leave comments down below and ask questions. And I really do try to answer them on the show, especially if it's something relevant, whether it's cameras or Nicaragua or travel or whatever get down there and become part of the show. It's very much appreciated. It helps me know what content you guys want and have content to do because some days I'm really struggling with what should I talk about today? And I know some of you will say, of course, Scott, we know it's really obvious that you ramble a whole lot, but I, I'm trying to provide really good content for you guys. And uh, I don't always know exactly what it is you want. So take a moment, get down there, of course, like and subscribe and all that while you're doing it. And for those who are not aware, because I haven't mentioned this in a while, and some of you are working in IT, I wrote Linux Administration Best Practices for Packed Publishing. It's available on Amazon. And a great way to support this channel is to buy it. There'll be an image up here. So you know what it looks like. You can go to Amazon and just buy it, or there'll be a link down below in the description. It's not for everybody. It has nothing to do with the channel in general, but I did write that book while living in Nicaragua. And if you'd like to support me, uh, it would be amazing if you bought that. All right, let's get on to our first question for the day. You have to excuse me as I read this to make sure I'm getting it correct. Patricia Flaherty says, if you haven't done one already, I'd like a video comparing Nicaraguan landlords to American landlords. What sort of maintenance do they cover? Are they responsive to issues with the property? What do you do if you end up with a really bad landlord? Do you just leave? Is there a Nicaraguan Judge Judy to help settle any dispute? Are there apartment complexes where you'd be dealing with a professional property management company, or does everyone rent from individual homeowners? Okay, so for this, I mean, in a lot of cases, I think you'll find the Nicaraguan landlords and American landlords are surprisingly similar. Of course, nobody has that much experience with either. My experience with American landlords has been relatively poor, and you'll probably find the same experience in Nicaragua. In general, people are not thrilled with their landlords, right? That's kind of universal. You're going to get some amount of responsiveness, and it's never going to be fantastic. It's very much the, the exception, not the rule, when you get someone that is really good. But, of course you can get them. Now, let's get to the Judge Judy bit first, because I think that's most important. If you're going to be dealing with anything like that here, anything where you have a really serious dispute, uh, especially as an expat, chances are what you want to do is have a lawyer. You want to have one that's always at the ready. This is going to be something that's important for you as an expat. If you were to live in the United States and have the same kind of relative affluence that we will assume an expat living here is almost certainly going to have, you would need a lawyer all the time in the United States as well. This would be a normal course of events. It's not something that would uh, be unusual in any way whatsoever. It's simply a lot of people moving from the U.S. are not in a position to be able to afford one uh, because they're not that relatively affluent in the United States. So you may be facing a different world here, but given your buying power in the country, almost certainly having a lawyer here makes a lot of sense. Just having one that you have at the ready, you don't need to deal with a dispute court, simply call your lawyer, let them deal with it. This is also important. Uh, if you're planning on being here for a long time, you're gonna need a lawyer anyway to deal with things like your uh, your residency. So that's just an important part of life. And this is true for anyone living abroad, basically anywhere. If you're just a tourist and you're somewhere for three weeks or even two months, 
you don't need a lawyer. But if you're going to be moving somewhere and need to be navigating the legal system, uh, dealing with purchasing property, dealing with maybe getting a car or running a business or getting residency or a citizenship, almost certainly you're going to need a lawyer. I have lawyers in multiple countries for this reason. It's just normal. So don't think of that as weird, but that is how you would want to handle pretty much any kind of dispute because you do not want to be the one navigating a foreign country's uh, legal system nor a dispute management system. Just because you have a lawyer doesn't mean you're going to be suing anybody. It just means that they're going to be the ones that are going to contact people and say, hey, look, there's a problem. Uh, you didn't, you know, you didn't fix the electric. They've been without electric now. So how about uh, we knock some money off the rent or how about you get this fixed before I know if the contract or whatever, uh, they, they know how to handle those situations. Uh, so it's uh, don't think of it as this very litigious thing. Think of it as this is a person who's trained and professional at doing exactly this thing that you need done. Uh, that's their job. Right. And the same thing would happen in the U.S. Someone's bothering you. You just want to have a good conversation with them, but you want to make sure it's recorded in the right way. You want to make sure you don't overstep your bounds. You want to make sure you do it properly. You have a lawyer. They just send out a letter. They make a call, whatever is taken care of. It does not mean you're going to sue somebody. It's also nice having a lawyer just in case it does escalate. You have some legal protection that someone is ready to step in, is aware of the situation, and is in a position to actually do something. So it provides a little bit of peace of mind anyway. But we use our lawyer for all kinds of things, including uh, just very basic aspects of house hunting, even for apartments. If we're looking for an apartment, normally our lawyer is going to maybe not find it for us. That would be slightly weird, uh, unless they just happen to be friends with someone who had a place but they may be involved in the contract, overseeing it from the beginning, uh, making sure that we're getting information that we need, hooking us up with the right resources for stuff. Lawyers do an awful lot, uh, especially in markets where they're not so incredibly uh, highly paid like in the United States. So that's, that's basically the answer to that part. Overall, I think uh, Nicaraguan landlords err on the side of being cheaper than American landlords, which is saying something because American landlords are ridiculously cheap on average. Um, you will find that getting things fixed in your apartment is generally a hassle, but isn't it always? I've never had an apartment that got a lot of things fixed really quickly unless it was a major item. I did have a luxury apartment in New Jersey and they fix things just like that. But in general, it's not that great. They're not that responsive. Um, here, of course, you can get landlords who are great and, and are really responsive. Uh, we had someone, we lived in Labo Rio. They were amazing. Anytime we needed something, they were there. They would come in personally, make sure it was fixed the same day or bring in a crew right away to deal with whatever it was. And so, so you can get these really great scenarios. We also know people who've had terrible ones that are, uh, actively stealing their electric, for example, like things like that will happen. But again, it'll happen in the U S but probably not as often. So, uh, I think it's a, uh, you know, be cautious, uh, be aware that you may be stuck with a landlord, use a lawyer, listen to your lawyer. If they say, I don't think this guy's a good person to rent from probably isn't right. Move on, find a different place. But in general, I wouldn't be concerned about it, but be prepared that probably part of having an apartment here is that you're going to be doing some amount of the work yourself. And that's generally okay. Uh, you want to paint the walls. You want to put in air conditioning. You want to change things around. They tend to be way more open to you making adjustments for yourself than American landlords tend to be, but they also tend to be a bit more resistant to fixing things that are not emergencies than American landlords uh, may tend to be. Um, it's also very important to note, we have said this before, but it's hard to drill this home and really make people uh, internalize it, is that uh, generally appliances uh, and most things in an apartment don't come with the apartment you're expected to bring them yourself. So in the United States, if you're going to rent an apartment, you assume that the apartment would be essentially empty unless you specifically got a furnished one, but it would definitely have a fridge, definitely have a microwave, uh, definitely have an oven. All those things, those are definitely so like you'd be like, you, seriously, you don't have a fridge. What world are you from? Right. I don't even know if you can legally rent a place without a fridge. I'm sure you can. But. Can you? You can't practically do it, that's for sure. Um, laundry machines, normally those are included, like just about everything. Not always, just generally. If you're renting a house, a few of those things are less likely, ah, you're less likely to have a laundry machine, but you're still definitely getting a fridge. Um, you're, you certainly have a sink. Here in Nicaragua, it's not quite as extreme as Italy, where you actually won't get a sink in some cases, uh, but all those appliances, anything that's electrical, anything that's gonna come from uh, a white goods store, right, an appliance store, they're not going to come with the apartment like ever. That's just assume that is not an option. You might get lucky. There may be one or two places in Managua, especially really high end that may include those. That is 
definitely an exception, not a rule, very rare, very unlikely. Uh, so assume if you're getting a normal apartment or renting a house uh, from a landlord, even if it's a, a, a company, you're gonna be providing all the appliances. That means you gotta buy them somewhere. And then if you're going to move to another place, you gotta store it or ship it, whatever. Uh, and, and of course, plates and those kinds of things, you're gonna be providing those. Air conditioning, 90, 95% of the time, if that's something you want, you have to provide it. Of course, you generally get to take it with you when you go. So that just becomes something you store and move however you're gonna do that. Um, furniture, of course, if those things are not included, furniture is not included under normal circumstances, shower curtains, basic things, those are not gonna be included. And those are not always included in the US, but be aware, when you go into an apartment here, generally there are no curtains, no shower curtains, no appliances of any sort. There's gonna be light bulbs, Hopefully, there will be very basic electric, there will be counters, there will be a sink, there will be a toilet, uh, there will be, you know, um, shutters on the windows, because that's, that's typically how it's done, but it's going to be extremely basic, very bare, that gives you the capability to really customize, and this is one of the reasons that they do it, is because the people who are uh, very poor and can barely afford the apartment, they're gonna go for minimum appliances and keep that cost extra low. They may have a, you know, if you're renting for say $100 a month, you put in really basic appliances, and over the course of two years, you may be amortizing only maybe $110 to $120 a month to have all that stuff, and that's how they're gonna live. But someone else who's a bit more affluent but taking that same apartment may come in with much better appliances and amortize over two years, more like $100 a month for a total of $200 a month is what they're paying for that apartment. And so they allow people to customize a bit more because um, some of the biggest expenditures that people are making are actually in the white goods, in the appliances, instead of in the apartment itself. People are much less likely to pay for a view, much more likely to pay for an upgraded set of appliances, but because the apartment couldn't possibly reliably provide what's going to be seen as the right value um, and benefit, they would just end up overspending or under delivering. This allows the, the renters to really make those decisions and get the place that makes more sense for them at their price point and the things that matter to them. So that customization is important, but as an expat, as a, as a tourist, as a digital nomad who's looking to rent for 12 12 uh, months maximum, or, or I guess maybe 18 months, but, but six months to 12 months, kind of the range, it, it can be very problematic that those things are generally not available in the market and you have to buy all those things and then hope to sell them, which is not a very good used market here. Not that people wouldn't be interested. There's just not a big uh, amount of buying and selling used, which makes it very difficult to sell because you just now have people knowledgeable of shopping in that way. So while you could buy and then sell, it could be a problem. So that challenge will, will really be pretty big. And I'm just gonna do a soft announcement. As part of this channel and the work we do with Relocate Nicaragua, one of the things we're actually trying, because I'm really interested in this, and I did mention this a couple months ago and, and got some interest. So uh, based on that feedback from you guys, thank you very much uh, for, for that feedback. Hopefully it was honest feedback and, and useful. Uh, one of the things we're looking at actually getting into here because of what we do here, we think this would be perfect, uh, is actually offering short-term furnished and appliance-sized uh, rentals uh, starting right here in Sutiava. And so we actually have our first apartment here that is available. Um, we're taking uh, reservations, but not for several weeks. It's gonna be out a little bit. So I don't know exactly what the first date is going to be, but if you're looking at like the November, uh, December timeframes, it's going to be available uh, for that. So if anyone's interested, it's gonna be here in Sutiava. So it's on the west side of the city of Leon towards the beach. Uh, specifically, one of the reasons that we got it is because it's uh, quite close to the uh, bus station. So uh, as expats who are looking to be here, or digital nomads, who are gonna be here for short term, um, we wanted to be in a spot where public transportation makes it very useful. And we picked a place because of who we are and, and the way we work with things, we decided to start with something that was accessible to the beach. So this is a place that is not in the beach. It is a city or actually a barrio apartment, uh, relatively spacious. Um, we will be showing it once it's all finished and everything. We'll definitely put up pictures and videos and, and get you guys along for the ride. Uh, and of course, being furnished, it's, it's vastly more expensive than if you're buying an unfurnished place and having to supply appliances and all that. We're also not doing it on a six month, right? Where uh, we assume that the longest someone would be interested 
interested in it is six months. Not that we would limit someone, if someone wanted it for a year, well, fine, we'll just go get another apartment and do the project again. That's our goal, right? We wanna grow this and provide uh, more flexible housing for expats who are coming down maybe maybe to look for a place to live or trying out a region before they buy or needing a place for a more flexible time period until they're able to find and close on a house or whatever. So our target is not to have uh, real hard limits on, oh, you have to take it month by month. It might be a minimum of, of a month. We don't have all the numbers worked out, but like there's a minimum and then maybe it's it's done by week uh, so that you, you have that flexibility to be like, we found a house, we're moving out in two weeks. Good, like you don't have to worry about breaking a lease or anything like that. You don't have to worry about owning appliances. You don't have to worry about like any of that. It's gonna have internet, it's gonna have air conditioning. It's gonna have, you know, a place to sit and a place to work and a place to sleep and all those things are gonna be included. Uh, so it's, it's in between a hotel hotel room and an apartment. Really, it's kind of like an Airbnb, right? But one that is designed less around vacationing and far more around you want to experience living in the area for an extended period of time, but not so long that you've essentially moved into the country uh, or, or you're in that transition period and you need that flexibility to do it. So we're trying to address all that. So we have our first place. I'm very excited about that. So when I talk about how terrible the landlords are here. I am now one of them. Um, so watch out for us. But uh, I'm very excited about that project and I'm really interested to see where it goes. Part of my, my grand vision with that is to get apartments like this and it could be houses that are standalone this one is an apartment um, in different parts of the country so that uh, but in places that may be of interest places that we kind of hand select as like we really like this area we think it shows off a style of living or we think it shows off an area it kind of showcases some aspect of Nicaragua uh, so either people who are really looking for a super interesting massively in-depth tourist experience like a like a really long-term tourist experience may want to use them but more likely people who are investigating nicaragua on a really broad scale to say i want to move to nicaragua i think but i want to really sample it and how do you do that and and no one knows how to do that short of you know throwing money at it renting uh places all over the place making huge commitments buying uh, all the appliances moving them around getting it like it's really hard right, to get that broad scope unless you're just staying in hotels and then it's a different experience. So we're trying to really bridge this gap and allow not just other people, right, but not just you guys, not just the, the people who live in my GoPro box, but I wanna make it that I can do this too, right? Now I have lived in different parts of Nicaragua and I visit different parts and I have friends all over. So I tend to get a pretty decent local experience even when I go to places that I don't get to live in, right? I've never lived in Esteli, but when I go there, I tend to experience it a little bit more probably significantly more like a local than like a tourist, um, but I'm still a tourist. I'm still not just starting my day waking up in one of the barrios. I'm starting in a hotel in the middle of the city. Uh, and, and so that gives you a very different view of any town, any city, any region. Um, and so I wanna bridge that for myself as part of this. I wanna be able to stay in my own apartment, maybe not for long periods of time, but for a week or two here or there, go and and go to a city where we don't have these yet, but we'll use Esteli as the example again. Go have a, a, a nice place that we selected in a region of Esteli that we think is indicative, kind of showcases what life in that area might be like and gives you an idea of what your life in Esteli could be like. And then you can also come here to Leon and say, okay, how do I compare and contrast? Uh, uh, you know, I, I did a month in Esteli, I've done a month in, in Leon, and, and what did I experience during that time? Was the weather to my liking? Was the day-to-day -day traffic something I liked? Did I like the type of events, the nightlife, the variety of restaurants? Because once you're here, those things are really important and they're very hard to evaluate in a week or even two weeks, right? You need a bit of time, you need to be on Pedita's jaw, you need to be walking walking around, you need to be going, I really want some takeout Chinese. What are my options here? Right, and, and in trying to find the meal you want from time to time, that rare thing that this, this plant is really prickly and keeps sticking to my arm, I think it's gonna provide something really amazing. So that's my vision, but this is uh, our first apartment here in Sutiaba. We wanted to have it in a place where we could firsthand be involved with the process. Uh, and we're getting a lot of people all of a sudden who are interested in Sutiaba and all of them who have come here 
uh, that have, have talked to us in any way. Some people have come and not told us, and then there's like, I moved to Sutiava because of you, and you're like, what? Um, but of people who have, who have worked with us in any way to come to Sutiava uh, to rent or whatever, all of them have had the same experience that they desperately needed some form of short-term rental, and there just isn't that option. And what there is as options, like hotels, are, are quite far away, uh, making it very, very difficult uh, to do anything in this part of the city. So that's why we're starting here. We think it just makes an awful lot of sense. All right, that said, are there management companies that do uh, like, like more traditional apartment buildings where you have uh, a number of units and a professional? Okay, so yes, technically there are. There are very few and far between to the point where I don't know of a single one here in Leon, the second biggest city, but I do know they do definitely exist in Managua. I believe they exist in San Juan del Sur. Uh, but those may be the only markets. They probably exist in Granada and maybe in like Matagalpa. But in general, it's going to be very rare to find something like that. Maybe for a full scale house where you're renting something really large, maybe. Uh, but for regular apartment size, definitely Managua, but I don't know any other city that's going to have it. Probably San Juan del Sur, almost certainly. Um, and, and possibly in the enclaves where you have an entire complex built by a single company and they're managing pretty much everything about it. I know that was popular in Panama. Um, I believe it, it happens here. But it's not something we've looked into uh, and it's certainly rare. Uh, so do those exist? Yes. Are you going to encounter them in the places you're interested in? Almost certainly not. But don't be completely surprised if you come across one. Just don't go out with the assumption you're gonna find one. That would be, uh, Unlikely. Well worth noting is that there are management companies here, or at least companies that claim to be management companies, uh, that go out and manage individual properties and kind of act like a, a normal management apartment firm, but they, they don't own the properties that they're working with. Those do exist. However, it's important to note, I've never once heard of someone using one that turned out to be legit. I guarantee there are some that are legit, just saying that those have a very high seemingly rate of being less than legitimate and less than legitimate could mean a lot of different things here. It could mean, and these are some of the things we've experienced, uh, outright um, uh, attempts to steal property, misrepresenting property, stealing from people in different, uh, whether overcharging or not delivering what they're supposed to, um, putting up homes uh, for rent that don't really exist, like a lot of weird things. We've run into some pretty strange things um, all throughout the country uh, looking at those kinds of things. So, so I would just say be extra cautious cautious working with a company like that if they are uh, represent, you know, they kind of act like, oh, we just represent all these properties. We have all these things. That's why you want to come to us. Be really wary. They have a tendency to not represent the places that they say that they do and the places that they work with may not be getting represented in a fully legal way. And you could easily end up in the middle of a legal dispute where maybe they rented you a place and you've paid for a place that they don't have the right to rent to you. That's not the end of the world. It's not the same as someone, you know, actually stealing a house and trying to sell it to you and then finding out you paid $200,000 for a place that was not even for sale. That is really scary. This is, well, you rented a place, you paid for a few months, and now it turns out you have to move and you're not getting your money back because you gave it to someone who had no obligation to the house whatsoever. Just be aware, those kinds of things can happen, and and it's worth knowing that if you're dealing directly with the people who own it, uh, or you know that one-on-one -on -one thing, you, you have a really good chance, or if you have a property company where they own the whole place, it's kind of the same thing, right? They just have a lot of them. Um, and like the people that we rented from in La Borea, while it's just a father-son team, and each it's just individual houses, he owns many, many, many properties throughout the area and operates like a rental company, even though it's just him and his son, and they do all the maintenance themselves or just hire it off you know as a one-off it's not the feeling of an apartment company but he's acting like one even though the properties are basically standalone houses all right our next uh it's actually two posts from the same person from um uh, bernard Branick, i believe that's right uh bernard sabranek I'm not sure. And uh, so he has two comments, but they're basically the same. But I'm going to cover this. And these are these are comments, uh, but about his budget of living here on a relatively low budget. And I think this is some good information. People are always interested in living budgets down here. I moved to Nicaragua from the USA in 2014, so nine years ago. Live in a small city south of Granada. I rent a 2600, that's probably Nindiri, I'm just guessing. I rent a 2600 square foot, two bedroom, two bath colonial home. So this is an older house, two bed, two bath. So smaller side, but these are still 2600 square feet, that's big. 
I live very comfortable on $800 US a month. I don't drink alcohol, that accounts for a lot of the, the budget. Uh, I pretty much eat what I want and eat out a couple times a month. I don't drive much, but about 3,000 miles a year. My bedrooms have AC, but I never use it. Use only the ceiling fan and floor fan. Monthly electric is $60. Internet and cable, $32. Water, just $3. $20 for gas for cooking and clothes dryer. So he's got a, a dryer that he uses. We have one here now too. I need to do a little video on that coming up soon because we just got it. It's a new thing. We'll talk about that in an upcoming video. Uh, but this is worth noting that um, for gas here, that is gas delivery. It is not a pipe. It's not in ground. That's where you have a service that uh, Tropic Gas normally brings you out a canister of fuel. And that's so he's spending about $20 a month on that. That's pretty good. Uh, $20 monthly gas for the car. It gives you a feeling of how little he drives. Uh, $50 a year for basic car insurance. $25 a month for a maid to clean the house once a week. I love Nicaragua. All right. And then he follows up. I'm not actually sure which order these were posted in uh, now that I'm reading them. Uh, basically the same information, but I've been living in Nicaragua since 2014, live south of Granada, rent a 2,600 square foot, two bedroom, two bath colonial home for $250 a month. So he didn't mention that last time. Last time. So $250 a month, which is in line, I would say, with what we see out here. Uh, Granada is just a tad more expensive than Leon in general, but he's not in the city. He's somewhere towards Nindiri, uh, which would be a little bit cheaper, for sure. Uh, I live extremely well on just under $1,000 a month. I eat well, have hot water in the bathrooms and AC in the bedrooms, but never really use it. Bought a brand new car in 2017 paying cash. Paid an average. He probably did not work that into his budget of the under $1,000 a month I'm assuming. Uh, I pay average $60 a month for electric, water on average three, trash pickup twice a week for $1 a month. Wow, that's a deal. Uh, gas for cooking and clothes dryer, 20 to $30 a month. Gas for car, $20 a month, don't drive much. Cable Wi-Fi, 32. Maid comes in once a week, cleaning for $30 a month. I love Nicaragua, beautiful country and loving people. Because my mother was born and raised in Nicaragua, I had immediate citizenship when I moved here. So he moved here nine years ago, immediately got citizenship, which doesn't change his cost of things really, but does make uh, some things a little bit easier, made it that he was able to buy a car as soon as he wanted uh, and so forth. But I think that's great information. We've done a number of videos where we talk about the budgets here, the cost of things, um, and we always see different prices in different regions. Everyone has a different experience with what they need, um, but really telling is that he has AC and doesn't need it, right? That's something we talk about a bit. When we say that we have AC and, and some places don't, and we don't run it that often, you don't need it in every part of the house, you get lots of comments from, especially North America, who are like, you absolutely need AC 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you can never get away from it, it's so blooming hot in Nicaragua that of course you need AC, don't be, uh, don't be absurd. But realistically, those of us who live here, once you've been here and gotten over that gap, like I did the mild weather video just the other day, once you're over that gap, that hot temperature isn't that bad. It just isn't. Somebody needs AC all the time. But lots of people, including those of us from the north, don't once we've acclimated. I can easily sleep nine days out of ten at least without AC. I want the windows open but I don't even need a fan most times. Maybe one time out of ten and then one time out of ten I may really feel that I need the air conditioning. I use the air conditioning more than that, mostly because my wife needs it. But if it's just me, uh, if she's out of town, and it's just me and the dogs, even with the dogs, I don't need a fan. I don't need the air conditioning on. And it's not all that uncommon that I don't need the windows open. Generally, I would prefer it, but sometimes I don't worry about it. It's really not that hot at night. Like we cool down, we're into the mid seventies, which is honestly quite comfortable for sleeping when you're used to being in warm temperatures 24 seven at night, that can be very comfortable. You've adapted. And so that's, that's a big thing, right? Um, even if you need something, it's generally going to be a ceiling fan or a floor fan. That's going to be enough for almost everyone. And that's even here in Leon. If you go for someplace cooler, you know, Granada, Managua, Rivas, you're going to be like, oh yeah, it's really not that bad. And if you go for the mountains, you're golden. You're going to, probably need some blankets and stuff to keep you warm. But he's also on that budget, right? Around $800 a month, has a full colonial house, multi-bedroom, multi-bathroom, so that gives us a really good idea on what a budget can be if you're not going out that much, not driving very far and don't drink. 
coming in well under a thousand dollars a month with some pretty nice amenities and while he has a car and that's probably very handy especially for shopping in Managua it's something he could almost certainly live without maybe he'll comment on this and let us know what life would be like without a car and where he's using it but only twenty dollars a month uh, of gas means that the amount of driving that's being done has to be relatively low he said about three thousand miles per year so because of that you could hypothesize what he'd be able to do if he used a personal driver for example which does not mean having a chauffeur on staff. It means you may have a taxi driver in town, for example. We have several here that we're able to call on and say, I'd like to have a driver for the day or maybe just a driver for uh, an hour or two. And yes, you're going to pay more than if you're taking a taxi ride, but you get a dedicated driver who may take you really far. For example, they will take us all the way to Managua, a few hours away, with maybe a car or maybe a van uh, and go spend the day, do shopping, and then come home. And yes, we're going to pay a premium for that, but not needing to uh, pay for car maintenance, not needing to deal with the, the auto shop, not needing to purchase a car or keep insurance or any of those things, because that was something that was on his budget as well. In this example, you may be able to say, oh, that'd be less convenient, but it may be cheaper, or it may be uh, a little bit more expensive, but within a, the realm of reason, it's not, it's not terrible. These are uh, realistic expenses. So thank you very much for sharing that with our with us, Bernard. That is a really valuable uh, pricing example of someone who's really here, been here for nine years. And that is part of the trick, of course. Being here for a long period of time, you're going to get cheaper and cheaper simply because you know how to do things. You know where to shop. You know which things are important. You know when you're going to use AC and when you're not. You know that you can invest in better AC units that cost less to operate and so forth. Those things accumulate over time. Just that experience of a new place and that will make the entire process that much easier. So thanks for joining me today. Like and subscribe if you have any questions. Like I said at the beginning, get down there and ask them. I'd love to have more content to put on the video. My plan for tomorrow is we're going to talk about shopping and how our views on shopping, not just not the uh, concept of consumerism, we had an episode on that some time ago, but um, how we approach shopping to uh, maximize that for uh, living here, because that is one of the things that proves to be a challenge. It is uh, not necessarily a negative here, but it is a huge factor. So we're going to talk about things that we do, how we buy things, how we change what we buy, uh, how we plan for buying uh, to maximize our effectiveness of having a uh, uh, limited ability to do shopping here in Nicaragua. So tune in for that tomorrow. I think it's going to be a good episode and I'm trying to do a little bit of planning ahead so that I can watch the video from yesterday and say, well, what was I supposed to talk about today? Uh, as always, share with your friends, family, post on social media. If you'd like to support the show, you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash Scott Allen Miller. That comes directly to me and helps me afford all the cameras that keep overheating and things like that. We've got the new GoPro 12 is in hand with Paul and should be here on uh, Tuesday. Uh, we will be seeing the first footage from that coming up sometime in about 10 days, I think. Uh, and I'm really anxious to see how the overheating situation is. That's really what I got it for, is uh, that it, it came with a couple of batteries and that it should reduce the overheating, which gives us much better battery life and so forth. So I'm very excited about that, even though that's very utilitarian. Hey, it's, it's something. And I use my GoPro so many hours of the day. Like, I don't think people understand just how much I use a GoPro every day. Somewhere between three and five hours per day, I have a GoPro either uploading, recording, cooling down something that I'm actively working with it. And right now I only have two. Simply going to three cameras is going to make my overall arsenal of, of equipment that much easier. I'm going to have so much more that I can physically do, uh, but it's going to give me more batteries, more time to cool down because I actually cycle them through air conditioning to cool down the cameras while I'm recording. It's kind of crazy. So your donations through Buy Me A Coffee help make all of this possible in a very real way. There, there's actually expenses necessary to make this show. And uh, if you're looking for assistance or guidance or information on the apartment that we have, info at relocatenicaragua.com that is on the new email system and working great. I will see all of you tomorrow.